Hello. Uh, so, <clears throat> I will present you some basic notions of magnetohydrodynamics, what it is, um, and so, well, my name is Dana Tokan, like, you know, Antonia said, and um, I will pre present you um, what ideal MHD means, um, what the, the equations, the conservation equations want, and what they describe. Um, some um, parameters that define the, and describe the plasma and how much plasma there is uh, with respect to magnetic field and with some other parameters. And clock, clock, time, time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then how the charged particle um, move in electromagnetic fields and some notions about shocks and discontinuities. Now, first of all, what is IDM, ideal MHD? So, it describes the, um, this one, it's definitely not magic, right? So, it's a really beautiful topic that describes the, the interaction of the plasma with the magnetic field, how it moves, how the energy changes, and how the mass fluctuates in, in, um, in, in the system. And it's composed of, so magnetohydrodynamics, so it's hydrodynamics, and which is fluid, and magnetopart, the magnetic field, right? So it's based on the equations of dynamics and Maxwell's equations, right? Now, what about the ideal part? It, st it starts from quite a lot of assumptions, but it, the, the areas in which it stands for, it describes it really well. And it starts from, okay, didn't do nothing. No. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, the characteristic time must be much higher than the mean free path time. Uh, the scales. Much be, must be really large, so at least larger than the mean free path length. Um, the velocities are definitely not rel relativistic. And there's the quasi-neutrality <coughs> assumption that the, the ions and the electrons are in the same proportions. So overall is quasi-neutral, the, the system itself. And all of the dissipative processes, uh, the um, viscosity, the resistivity, the thermal conductivity, they're all neglected. So with all these assumptions, you may, you may wonder when, when is actually good, right? When is it actually useful? So it is really useful to describe the microscopic uh, force balances, um, the equilibria, and everything that is on large scale, such as the heliosphere, right? Um, it is a really good predictor of plasma stability, and it describes the, the solar wind, the heliosphere, Earth's magnetosphere, again, on large scales, um, the magnetospheres are of other stars and inertial ranges of plasma turbulences. Of course, with so many assumptions, there's also, there are also topics when it's, it's not useful, and especially when the kinetic effects are quite important. You cannot really use MHD anymore because it's a very small scale, so it kind of breaks down. For instance, at, but I'll talk about it later. Okay. And, um, Another example is when the particle distribution functions are Maxwellian, for instance, in cosmic rays, this one, the distribution function, right? Uh, or where the, when the plasma is weakly ionized. And like I said, the small scale ones. The ideal MHD equations. They're beautiful, right? Now, at a glance, they, they look horrible, I know, <laughs> but they're actually really beautiful and described in a mathematical way, the, the motions, the, the mass, the, it, it describes pretty much everything that you can describe within the assumptions. It's awesome. And they describe the perfectly conductive fluid, you know, when it interacts with the magnetic field. And I will, I will present you the conservative form, which is in the shape of um, a partial uh, derivative of time. So how the, and this will be of density and um, a divergence of a flux. So this will be density, this will be the flux. And overall, this change has to be zero. 
right? And we are also assuming that the divergence of B is zero. So there are no magnetic monopoles because there weren't any observed so far. I'm not saying there's none, <laughs> but within our limitations of knowledge, there are no magnetic monopoles observed. And <coughs> now, the M equation, the, um, the equations, the, the ideal MHD equations can consist of mass, momentum, energy, and magnetic plus conservation. And I will start explaining each one of them. The first one, the mass conservation, it actually says that the, the rate of change in the density within a control volume must be equal to how much flux it remains in that volume because the plasma moves, the flux passes through that volume, there, the mass, the mass also, um, so through this volume, right? There's mass flood flows in, mass that flows out. Whatever stays in has to be equal to the difference in time of the density. And this overall, this sum must be zero, right? So basically if you have one apple, you cannot just pop up and run out of that by magic. That just doesn't happen. So the input must be equal to the output, right? There's no accumulation in that control volume. And the rho is the density, and V is the velocity of the flow. The <coughs> momentum equation. This, if the previous one was showing the, the difference in mass and in density, this one shows how the fluid moves. And this is influenced also by the magnetic field as you can see here. So if in the mass we had no speed here, this was just density, and now we're just basically adding density, uh, speed, right? So this is the derivative in time of the momentum density. So how the, the change in, in the plasma movement, how it changes, how the plasma movement changes, right? And, and the plasma movement is indicated by the gradient of the flux of momentum, right? Because all this has to be a flux and this has to be a density, right? So this is the flux of momentum. So momentum and the flux. And it's also influenced by the pressure of the plasma from the fluid part, which affects just like the, um, the winds, right? If there's a high difference in pressure, then there are fast winds. And if there's a low difference or gradient in the, in the pressure, slow winds. Um, and the magnetic pressure, which affects the field lines like, in, like here. Um, if there's a high B here, it's a concentration of field lines, then it tends to, to equalize the, the, uh, the magnetic field. And in this direction is the pressure force from the magnetic part, right? So this, this is the pressure the magnetic pressure. And this is a scalar, so it has to be multiplied with the, with the matrix, so you can actually apply to that, the divergence. And this one is the magnetic tension, the last term, which acts to straighten the, the field lines. If they're bent, like this one, let's say, it tries to debend them, de-stress them, because this, this whole flux is a stress tensor. So how much stress is in the plasma? And this one is with a minus here because it tries to de-stress the plasma, to strain the field lines, right? And all these contributions lead to the movement of the plasma. Now, the energy conservation. <coughs> the energy of the plasma is given by the, the movement, right? The internal energy and the magnetic energy. And these are shown here, the kinetic energy, density, because again, this has to be density, the internal energy, and the magnetic energy. And this variation needs to be equal to the divergence of, of the flow in the kinetic energy, right? With the, with the variation of the flows of all the contributions. So this is the kinetic part, this is the internal energy, this is given from the pressure, from the fluid, from the plasma, right? And this is also the electromagnetic part from the contribution from the magnetic field. Okay. Now, they are all given in conservative variables because it's 
actually the um, conservative means that the, the, actually, the actual variables that are conserved within a change. And primitive means the, um, the pressure and, the, um, and other variables that are not so intuitive just to see how they are conserved. Okay, so this all this says that the entropy of any plasma element has to be constant, right? And the last one, the, very, the, uh, the magnetic field variation in time has to be equal to how much is uh, transformed from mechanical energy into electromagnetic induction. So how much electromagnetic flow appears there, it has to be equal to the variation of the magnetic field. And to better show this, I need a flux tube. And a flux tube is a set of magnetic, magnetic field lines enclosed by a, by a loop. And this can vary in time. This can vary, no, no, doesn't matter how, how much. It just stays the same number of magnetic field lines inside the loop, right? So it can widen, it can do whatever it wants. And from, from the magnetic flux conservation, we are going to the frozen in condition through some math that is beyond the scope of this presentation, right? I said minimum amount of math. <laughs> and this says that the flux that comes in must be equal to the flux that comes out. So the field lines are in strong correlation with the, with the plasma. The magnetic field influences the plasma and, and vice versa. So these are the conclusions from this. So the magnetic flux um, has to be conserved. That passes through the through a surface, right? Uh, the magnetic field lines behave as if they move with the with the plasma. Whatever plasma moves in this flux tube, the field lines follow that movement, and vice versa again. And the magnetic topology is conserved, which uh, means that no matter how much you torsion this this flux tube, it doesn't change. So therefore, we don't have any magnet magnetic reconnection which is, mm, but so is one of the assumptions. <coughs> now, let's talk about the one parameter that gives the ratio of the, let's say, how much plasma is it with respect to the, the, the magnetic field. And so this is given by the thermal pressure over the magnetic pressure, right? And they, all the plasma are based on the frozen in condition so all the time they influence one another, but it depends which component is more dominant, the plasma or the magnetic field. So if this beta is much lower than one, therefore B must be really high, so the magnetic field influences uh, the plasma, and this happens in the center of the sunspot, let's say. And um, if, the, um, if the plasma is more influent, more influential, if it dominates over the magnetic field, then the beta is much higher than one. And this happens in the solar wind because the plasma is really, um, the magnetic field is weak and therefore the plasma moves the magnetic field and creates the ballerina skirt. And <coughs> one example, how it changes, how the beta uh, changes is above an active region. And as you can see, beta is lower than one here. Yeah. And the magnetic field is stronger because it's right at the center of the sunspot. And outside, everywhere on the photosphere, beta is higher than one. And you can also see it here in a model of the plasma beta, that beta is higher than one on the photosphere. And therefore, the, the density, because the density is really, really high above the photosphere, right? So beta is higher than one. And then the density, as you can see also here, drops really sudden with five orders of magnitude. In, uh, from the photosphere to the corona. And you can see in, in the beta variation that it becomes lower than one. And also, even the temperature rises, it rises only with, let's say, three orders of magnitude. So there's a difference of three orders of magnitude. And so the beta drops a lot. Even though the magnetic field also decreases, it doesn't compensate with the decrease in the density. And in the solar wind, it starts to be the, the magnetic field also decreases a lot more and the plasma starts to, to act more, right? And therefore, beta is higher than, than one in the solar wind. Now, this number shows how the movement of the plasma 
is with respect to the magnetic field. How, how much the, um, there is kinetic energy with respect to the magnetic energy. And this is shown by the alpha Mach number. And it basically shows the, the RAM pressure, which is given by the movement of the plasma, over the magnetic pressure. Now, an example of um, subalphanic, if it's, so if the speed of the plasma is below the alpha speed, which is this one, then the flow is subalphanic. And a really good example is the, the local corona, where the, the speed is quite low. It, has, it didn't have time to, to accelerate the wind yet, so the speed is quite low. And the, um, the magnetic field is still strong. So low, strong, therefore lower than one, right? And an example of alpha Mach number higher than one is given by the, um, the solar wind. Because in the solar wind, the, at least at Earth, is usually around 10, let's say, the Mach number. And uh, there's a really good anti-correlation with the sunspot number because so as the sunspot number uh, decreases, there's the solar minimum. Solar minimum means lower magnetic field, so this one lowers, and the alpha max number rises, right? Okay. And a superalphanic, uh, this guy feels like superalphanic, and feels like this one, you know, during nighttime, when you want to kill it. Um, now, let's talk about charged particles uh, motions in electromagnetic fields. And the the force that dominates this kind of movement is Lorentz force. Not this one. It is this one. It's this guy that did the Lorentz force. Um, and this is basically Newton's second law, right? So it's the force given by the charge. And in, um, when in, a in the magnetic field and how it interacts with the electric field and how the, the particles, the particle movements, interact with the magnetic field, and this equals to mass times acceleration. Now, let's take the simple case where there's no electric field, and we're assuming only one component of the magnetic field. Uh, v has three components, the speed, and so that mass gives you the solution. This is the general solution. Now, we're taking, as initial conditions, only one component of the speed. And we're also defining the cyclotron frequency, which is this one here. We're introducing all here, and we go to the solution. So this is the equation of motion, right, of particles, into a magnetic field, because there's no electric field. And this is actually a circular motion, right? And so this, the, the initial speed time over the cyclotron frequency, is actually the radius with which the particle trapped in a magnetic field is rotating. And it's just rotating, it doesn't change the center of the center of rotation. It just, if it has a field line, it sticks to that one. And it just goes round and round and round, right? And this is dependent on the, on the um, charge. And you can um, get the, the rotation of the particle with the right hand rule. So if the speed is like this, B is like that, you're taking V cross B, you're taking V over B. So you're doing this, so the speed will be there, right? Just like this. Uh -huh. There's a speed. Now, in that case, V is here. Let me show you in an easier way. Right. <laughs> so V, this is the force, right? Now, in our case, V is there, and B is coming out, so force is down. Right? So when the, the charge is higher than zero, the force will be downwards. So that will be how the ions rotate. And it is like this one. Right? And the electrons rotate in the opposite direction. Make sure in the process don't end up like this. Okay. Now, let's put in some more initial conditions. And we have um, an initial speed is not just only one component of the speed. It's, also, it's everywhere, right? So it has an initial speed. And the motion will be a spiral along the magnetic field. 
it's not crossing, it's not changing the, um, the center of the, of the gyration. It just follows one field line and it goes along it. And again, the, uh, so the ions go like this and the electrons opposite, right? But it just rotates. Now, and the, the angle from the speed and the magnetic field, this is called the pitch angle, which you probably heard about, right? Now, what are the applications of the Lorentz force? Um, for instance, sharp particles in the magnetic field, they move like this. They move around, along the field lines, and here they encounter a strong magnetic field, V parallel to the field line becomes a zero, and it comes back. It gets reflected. And this is called actually a mirroring point, because they go back and forth, back and forth because uh, the field just goes really, really narrow. The, they they close to one another. And so if this one, back and forth, right? Or let's say accelerators that are used to, um, well, figures accelerate particles, but to synchrotrons, for instance, to bump particles into one another. And they are doing this by guiding the, the charged particles into a magnetic field or cyclotrons, and they, they guide the particles by passing them through an interface, and at each passing, this particle gets accelerated, and then therefore the radius gets even higher, and they smash it to a target. And there's also the linear accelerators, and here there are uh, an alternation of magnets, and at each passing of the alternations, the Right? Uh, the, um, the change in magnetic field accelerates the particle, and here it reaches with a really high speed, and it smashes again into something. They like smashing stuff. It's cool. Um, also, bubble and cloud chambers. This is a really good example. And they, they use these chambers to see the, the trajectory of charged particles, because neutrals just go straight, and you don't, you don't see them, right? They, they don't interact. So, for instance, here, this would be a point where a neutral just disintegrated into two particles. And you can see the trajectory of a spiral, how it loses momentum. And if you know the radius um, of this spiral, uh, you know how it's changing, therefore you know the charge, therefore you can find the mass. And you can find what particle it is there. It's really entangled, but trust me, you can do it. And, um, also, the electrons trapped inside the mighty flux ropes of ICMEs. Here, at the front, they go back and forth, back and forth. Because they're trapped in the magnetic field, and they have to be guided by the, by the magnetic field. Now, let's also add electric field perpendicular to B. What will this give? We take the speed, we make the substitution, plug it in the Lorentz force, and we get to a, a drift velocity, which is actually D cross B drift. And as you can see, this is independent of charge, independent of mass, independent of the, the initial speed. So all the particles go across the field lines. So if the field lines are like this, it goes across them, but they all go in the same direction. Doesn't matter if they're ions, doesn't matter if they're electrons, they all go in the same direction. Now, what about the gravity? because a good example of Earth, it has gravity. And um, for instance, this one here, this is the, the gravity force, the gravity, yeah. Um, and it gives a drift velocity that is dependent on the charge, right? So that means the ions go in one direction, electrons go in another direction. And this creates a current in, um, around Earth. Um, and this is how they move, right? Positives and negatives. I'm not gonna go that thing again. It's, you'll figure out. Okay. Yep, this is how they move. Okay. That went fast. Um, now, shocks and continuities. Um, they are all surfaces separating two different fluids with different physical properties, and they're both in, equi in equi equilibrium. And imagine can model the, um, can describe the, um, 
the fluid that is on one side and, it's, and the fluid that is on the other side. It kind of breaks down at the exact discontinuity. And because it's small scale and the other effect starts to kick in. And um, if this is a shock front, then this is the fluid upstream and this is the fluid downstream. So what is behind the shock? And this is the normal, uh, normal to the shock front. And this is the speed with which the, the shock is moving. And to have uh, an easier notation of the difference or the jump in the, property, in the variables, this is the notation that is used, that is generally accepted and used, right? For the difference between the variable here and the, the variable here. And the variables that are used to describe these, these two um, media are the density, the normal speed, the normal to the shock, the tangential velocity, and it's a velocity because the tangential plane, let's say here, it's a whole plane. It's not just one direction, so it has two components, and that's why it's, it's, a, it's a vector, right? So, because if you would have n, t, that's just two vectors, so that, that just gives a plane. It's not 3D, but this is 3D. So, the tangential component is always a vector. And the pressure, the normal magnetic field, and the tangential um, magnetic field. And if there's a discontinuity or, or a shock, this is given by the which one, which variable jumps, and uh, what happens at the discontinuity. And the difference between these two types are the, um, if the, um, the speed across, the normal speed across the shock, how is that speed? How, if there's mass flowing through the shock or not, right? And the content tangential discontinuity, there's no mass, but, and, but through the rotational mass can flow, but we'll, we'll go through that a little bit later. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, a different case of a, of a shock, right? Um, and when the, the jump, I'll call this a jump, right, with the bracket, the jump in the normal speed is different than zero, there, then there is a, a shock and it can be slow, fast, or intermediate. And again, mass flows through the, through the boundary of, the sh of a shock. Now let's take them one by one. The contact discontinuity, this doesn't really appear in, uh, in our solar system, so I'm not sure if there's any applicability. I found some that there are between some shocks in supernovas or some explosion of stars, but it's not applicable to our case, so it's fine. Um, so this basically just describes two media with different densities. And there's no interaction between them, the magnetic field doesn't change, the speed doesn't change, just two different media with different densities and temperatures. And there's no mass uh, flow across the, the discontinuity. Okay, the simplest case. The second one, the, tangen the tangential, this means, again, there's no mass flow, because it's not just continuity, but the, the B, the magnetic field, shifts angles. And that's uh, all it does at the discontinuity, right? So, and there's no uh, normal magnetic field at the this, at this interface. So if the, the magnetic field is parallel to the discontinuity, and th there is a jump in the, there can be a jump in the tangential magnetic field, and the, let's say this from goes like this, like this. That's all it does, right? And a good example of this is of this discontinuity is the um, tangential discontinuity or the stream interface between a fast uh, solar wind and a slow solar wind, because it catches up. There's only a difference in uh, speed and um, the magnetic field, right? But there's no mass flow through them. It's just faster, slower, and the interface between them. Okay. The rotational discontinuity. Well, here, this is a very cool image. And it shows exactly what it's doing. And, well, this one can actually have, um, so the magnetic field can be pointed towards the uh, discontinuity. So if it, it's like this, and this is the shock front, it can do, let's say, like this, right? 
And so it doesn't necessarily have to be, it's not parallel to the, um, to the shock interface. Discontinuity, sorry. And again, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's a particular case of the intermediate shock because um, here, it's, let's say there is, um, there can be a normal speed, so there can be mass flowing. If the shock is stationary, the mass can flow through it, but there's no jump in density. So it's just like a, a flow of the same density, flow. so it's just a, a normal flow, right? And, and this, the, the magnetic field just rotates. And here, I said this, the, uh, B tangential, which is the velocity, which is the vector, changes, but if there's no jump in the bit tangential. Well, what's up with that? So this is a vector. That means the vector can change direction, but not the magnitude. Oops. Okay? And that's why this is different from zero, and there's no jump here. So that means that the, um, the jump in the tangential um, magnitude of the, um, there has to be no jump in the magnitude of the tangential component of, my, of the magnetic field, but it has to rotate. And that's the only thing it does. And the really good example is a magnetopause at Earth, and this is a rotational discontinuity. All right, and the propagation speed of the flow through this is exactly the alpha speed. And I'm not, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part are the shocks. And as you can see, this is a very cool picture of a shock. And this is a plane going above the Mach number. This goes above the uh, sonic Mach number because it's the, the propagation speed and the character speed, speed of air. But in, in plasma, there are more characteristic speeds, so it's a little bit more complicated. And, but this is a very, really simple way of showing. So this means basically that the, um, the thing that flows through that plasma is moving faster than the plasma can react to it. And it's moving faster than the, the propagation of the wave and the propagation of the, inter, uh, of the information can go. And here, let's say, the, 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 um, the waves will be in the back of this, in the back, the sound waves, will be at the back of the, um, the plane because it's moving faster than the, the sound can propagate. And therefore, it creates a shock. So almost all the variables jump besides, no, let's go back to plasma. Um, only the normal magnetic field, the normal component of the magnetic field doesn't change. And these are the, so this is the sound speed of the plasma. This is the alpha speed of the, again, of the plasma. And like I said, it's not that easy. So it has to be the characteristic speed have to be a combination of these two, right? or not if this the alpha speed, where are my speeds? Ah, okay, yeah, <laughs> right. So this is this, the fast and slow speed will be the square root of this. And it's a combination of the sound speed and alpha speed. And also theta bn means the, um, the angle between the, the normal magnetic field and the, no, the, um, sorry, the normal, yes, here. So the angle between the magnetic field and the normal to the shock. And uh, as a function of these speeds, so these are the speeds at which waves can propagate. And there are um, three modes associated to this, these speeds, and there are three shocks correlated to those speeds. So the fast speed is the fastest. The, the alpha speed is the intermediate one. And there's a slow speed. And for each kind of mode, there is a shock associated. So if the, the, prop, the speed of the shock exceeds that each speed, therefore it creates a fast shock, a slow shock, or if it's between the, the alpha and the fast speed, and it crosses to, to one of the others, then it's an intermediate shock. Now let's take them one by one. By one. The slow, the slow one, right? So. Again, there's no jump in the normal magnetic field, so they are coplanar the, um, across the shock. And, um, and in this case, the magnetic field decreases and it gets refracted towards. So theta bn 
towards the normal to the shock. So if this would be the normal to the shock, and this would be how if there was no change, it gets refracted towards the normal, right? And this can be seen here in the jump. So theta bn in the beginning, if this was normal, it was quite high, and then it jumps and it goes to, to lower va uh, values. And also, b theta, if it gets closer to the normal, then the bt goes lower, right? So there's a jump whoop, lower, and the overall pressure increases. There can be certain, let's say, cases also from and combinations of shocks, and um, so, but this is the general case, and when the um, shock propagates uh, away from the, from the cause of the shock, let's say, away from the generator. And the density also has a jump. And this, so this is the, let's say, upstream of the shock, and this is downstream, right? Um, and here the shock propagates that way. So this is how it is after it gets, after the shock passes. And a really good example is an observation that by Wong et al. And in the, um, in the wind data, you can see that the speed increases. So in all the shocks, speed should, should increase, right? If it's an unusual shock in one of the, the general cases, because the speed has to be higher than the, um, the ambiental speed, right? So there's an increase in speed, there's an increase in the, in the density, an increase in temperature, just like here. And here, the magnetic field also increases. Wait. Yes. No. Uh, that's beta. That's beta. Sorry. Right here, the mighty field decreases. Great. Perfect. So it's um, it's a slow it's a slow shock. And you can look it up in in this article if you want more info on that. Now, a fast shock. When the the propagation speed of the of the shock is faster than the fast speed of the plasma, that was previously. Um, determine, yeah, V fast, and this is the fastest speed, right? Of the the fastest characteristic speed of the plasma, and in this case, after the shock has passed, so this is the shock front, this is the speed of the shock, and these are the magnetic field lines. Okay, after the shock has passed, the the magnetic field gets refracted away from the normal, so theta B n increases because so this is normal, as you can see, theta grows. And also the plasma pressure increases, but again, it's just for this particular case, the, the, the general case. There can also be shocks that propagate towards the, um, um, the generator, let's say. But I'm not going to go into that much detail. And um, a really good example of a fast shock is the, um, the bow shock in front of the Earth's magnetosphere because the speed, the, uh, the solar wind at Earth uh, reaches 10 alpha in Mach number, let's say, like, like I showed you in, um, in that variation with the sunspots, the, the average was 10, right? So it's super authentic, super fast, and it meets the stationary Earth, and the difference in the speed creates a, uh, a bow shock in front of Earth. So this is a fast shock. Now, there's also a shock at the um, term in, at where the heliosphere, um, so ah, this heliosphere, it finishes and it meets the um, intergalactic wind because we're also moving, right? So when the solar system also moves and in that movement, the heliosphere meets the, meets the wind coming from, the, from all the stuff that's beyond our solar system. And this is a fast shock. Now, the intermediate shock, this is when the speed of the shock is higher than the alpha in speed. So let's say you have three intervals, right? Fast, alpha in, slow. Any, anything that is in below slow and alpha in is a slow shock. It's in between, it's faster than fast speed is a fast shock. But in between this interval in the alpha in and fast, this is an intermediate shock. And if this is the speed of the shock, and it's going that way, then the magnetic field refracts, um, 
it switches sign. That means the tangential component of the magnetic field has to switch sign. So it, it actually gets rotated, if you might say. That's why the, um, the rotational discontinuity was this particular case of the intermediate shock. And there's an, um, there was an observed uh, intermediate shock in the solar wind, and because it was by this is data from Omni, I guess. So this is data of the magnetic field at Earth, and this is their, their analysis, but you can read it afterwards. So the, this is the tangential component in the shock frame because the, um, the coordinates from the shock and your Earth coordinates can not, usually don't match. So this, if you want to see if it's a shock, you might want to switch to the, to the shock system coordinate coordinate system. And this is the tangential component to the shock. And as you can see, it jumps from 0.2 to minus 0.2. So there's a rotation and nothing else changes. So this is an intermediate shock. Okay. And now I can show you a really cool example of what MHD can do. And this is what I'm doing right now. I am simulating uh, CMEs into um, bimodal solar wind. So it's uh, slow at the equator, fast up to, um, close to the poles. And I am shearing and creating cool CMEs. And those are the field lines, by the way, the, the black lines, OK? How cool is that? You can actually simulate the propagation of a blob of plasma just coming from the sun towards towards Earth. That is amazing. And so this is the, the blue stuff. It's the, the logarithm of the density. And yeah, that I think that was it. And some references if you want to go into it. And I got